this story is mysterious. On one level, it's a display of Jesus' power. St. Luke, through chapters 7 and 8, systematically tells a series of such stories that demonstrate Jesus' power over sickness and death and sin and nature and demons. And the point of these stories might very well be summed up in the odd question of his disciples. Who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water and they obey him? Well, this is God's son. And yet on another level, even as Jesus does exactly what we would expect him to do, by using his divine power as God's son to control the storm and to save his friends in the boat from death, the story contains a rebuke. Where is your faith? Have the disciples somehow failed in this story? Have we as the readers also shown our lack of faith by being awed alongside them? Is there some other reaction Jesus was hoping we would have? Storms, including the one in this story, are ripe for metaphorical interpretation. We still use storms as an image to describe everything from conflict to angst to rage to foul moods to the challenges that we face in life. I heard a preacher, a preacher once wonder if perhaps the storm in this story was an argument that was brewing among the disciples perhaps regarding their destination across the lake in Gentile territory and whether they should be going there or not. Whenever we use storms metaphorically, it is almost always to describe something bad or evil or unpleasant. And yet we're also aware that we need storms, right? Everyone loves a sunny day, but too many sunny days in a row without rain can be disastrous for crops and livestock and create the perfect conditions for wildfires. As we read this story and puzzle over Jesus' words to his disciples, I find myself wondering if maybe calming the storm, as dangerous as it is, is something that Jesus wouldn't want us to expect him to do. Luke is not vague about the fact that the occupants of the boat are in real danger. And it's not as though these men, some of whom, I'll remind you, are seasoned fishermen and experienced sailors, it's not as though they scared too easily. We have every reason to believe that they were in imminent danger of sinking. One of the things I notice about this story is that they call Jesus Master. It's much more common to call him Lord. Both those words have connotations of authority, but the Greek word for Master is especially technical and hierarchical. It means like chief or boss. And so I find myself wondering if, in this case, it might also mean something like captain. Like, for example, the captain of a boat. I wonder if the implication here is that, it, that the disciples think it's Jesus' responsibility to keep them from dying. And that's why they wake him up. We are perishing, they say, but maybe what they don't say is, you're doing a very bad job of piloting this boat. Maybe the storm isn't his fault, but maybe they think that the danger they're in is. And so I wonder, is that how we think of God? Do we hold God responsible in some way for the bad things that happen to us? I can't tell you how many stories I know in which it is that very stumbling block which stands between people and faith in God. Because evil exists, God must not. Because storms arise, God cannot be, or at least cannot be good. It just doesn't make any sense, right? It's foolishness. And that's the conclusion to which Job and his friends come. While Bildad and Zophar and Eliphaz are convinced that Job must have done something wrong to deserve his punishment, Job grows increasingly more convinced that God has actually sinned against him by allowing or even causing this tragedy to happen to him unfairly. 
After all, isn't God responsible for keeping virtuous people like him safe and happy? What kind of master would allow somebody like him to perish? But the, crea- the testimony of creation says otherwise. Here we see, by God's wisdom, our life and death, growth and decay, the nest and the hunt, sunshine and storm, darkness and light, all side by side. This is how creation has been from the beginning, and if we are to believe Scripture, how it always will be, because this is what the Creator has called good. How foolish is that? Paul knows enough about God from knowing Christ crucified to know that this foolishness, as mysterious as it is to us, is wiser than any wisdom of which we ourselves are capable. He sees God's weakness, weakness openly revealed on the cross, and sees that that weakness is stronger than all the strength and the power and the authority that humans wielded to put Jesus there. He observes that rather than doing what we would do in calling the wise and powerful and privileged of the world in order to sway the masses and bring the whole world under God's control, God instead chooses to call the weak, the shameful, the foolish, the despised, in order to shame those things that are, those people who are wise and strong, to, in his words, reduce to nothing the things that are. And so this story of Jesus and the storm leaves me wondering if one of the things that might need to be reduced to nothing is the belief in a master God who does what Jesus does in this story. A God who quiets storms, prevents calamities, violates the natural order of the world to save the people who we believe to be the best and the brightest and the most deserving, the most faithful, the most pious, the most virtuous. Maybe that's why Jesus asks his disciples where their faith is. Richard Rohr observes that only those who have received deep forgiveness themselves are capable of extending such forgiveness. He sees that it's our very brokenness, our need to be forgiven to begin with, that allows us to love others more fully. Could it be that this brokenness, rather than being a weakness of humanity, is actually one of our strengths? After reading this story and considering the testimony of the storm, I wonder if the same might be true of suffering. It's only when we ourselves have greatly suffered that we are most empathetic and motivated to love those who are, all, who are suffering alongside us. And so I begin to wonder if the suffering that exists in the world is not a bug, but maybe a feature. Now let me be absolutely clear. I am not saying that I believe everything happens for a reason. I'm not saying that I think God is doling out hardship in order to build character or bring about some greater good through suffering. What I am wondering is whether a storm can testify to God's presence. Can something be at the same time both terribly unpleasant and yet somehow also a place where God is hidden? Can God really be present in something so awful as a tortured death on a cross. Martin Luther famously wrote that a theologian of glory calls the good thing evil and the evil thing good, while a theologian of the cross calls a thing what it is. I used to think he meant that the theologian of the cross is wise enough to discern the difference between good and evil and call them what they are, but that's not what he said. I wonder now if he might have meant that a theologian of the cross is wise enough to know how foolish they are. Wise enough to see things for what they are, neither good nor evil, because so often they are both. 
Take a thunderstorm, for example. It's neither good nor evil. Lightning strikes spark wildfires, and dark rains ruin picnics, but fires renew forests, and rain brings growth and vitality to the earth. Here we have darkness and light, side by side, by the wisdom of God. Might this foolishness teach us something about what God considers wisdom? Might it also have something to say about the metaphorical storms we encounter throughout our lives? This is a deep mystery. We human beings, by our nature, like to apply our wisdom to solve mysteries. We observe misfortune and suffering, and we try to find a cause, or a reason, or a justification. I wonder if we do that work so that we can ultimately avoid these things, or like, be able to control the weather, as it were, so that we can avoid or, or calm the storms. Maybe we think if we understand how and why suffering works, then we can escape it, or at least control it, make it work to our advantage. If we don't understand it yet, we have faith that technology or knowledge or intellect will increase to the point that someday we will. But when I say mystery, I don't mean this is something that we are not yet wise enough to understand. I mean it's something that's fundamentally not understandable. Not by wisdom, anyway. I may be able to know how a storm forms. Even with enough information, I might be able to predict where it will go and what it will do and how long it will last but I will never be able to understand the purpose or the function of a storm because it has no purpose, no function. It just is. It's a storm. When the storm comes, there's nothing for me to understand. I can only stand under it and get wet until it passes. And so I wonder if maybe this is the faith that the disciples seem to be lacking today. Does their wisdom, their understanding of how God and the sea and the weather are supposed to work, keep them from being able to simply stand under the mystery of God revealed in the wind and the waves? The book of Job observes that it is God's wisdom that gives direction and guidance to the wind and the rain and the thunderbolt. Jesus can calm the storm. We see that. But is he disappointed that that's what they want him to do? Jesus did still this storm. But when another storm arose and threatened his life, he let the wind howl and the waves rage. He foolishly let his boat sink and allowed himself to perish. When we look at that storm, what do we see? Do we see proof of God's absence? Or do we see the mystery of God's presence? I wonder today, today, is that mystery limited to that one storm alone? Or do we have the ability to look at any storm, literal or metaphorical, and witness that same mystery? What storms are you weathering in your life right now? What storms are buffeting this community, this congregation? How might we listen for God's voice in that thunder? <laughs>